advocate, Elizabeth Alexander. Hello, everybody, all of you beautiful people. Good day. Today, we are here together to hear from Michelle LaVon Robinson Obama. You have to say the whole thing when you're on the South Side, so. <laughs> Lawyer, humanitarian, daughter, mother, wife and partner, visioner of unseen possibilities, cultivator of gardens, human gardens, nurturer of dreams, and for eight years with sheer and unflinching perfection, first lady of the United States. <laughs> All around the world, she has exemplified grace, courage, intelligence, necessary humor, integrity, and beauty which radiates from the inside out. She has inspired us with consummate self-possession. She is also a sister friend to many, and to my great fortune, one of the blessings of my life to me for over 20 years, before children, throughout children, and through the many twists and turns that all lives offer. Michelle Obama is true north. She is a compass. She is steady in the churning sea. And to anyone who knows her up close or at a distance, she has always been adamant about the importance of belonging to and serving her community in concentric circles moving out from home and radiating throughout the world. So today, we're going to have a conversation. Please welcome my beloved, our beloved, Michelle Obama. There's nothing like being introduced by a poet. <laughs> Thank well, you for that. I love you, babe. I love you, too. And I'm really excited for us to talk with everybody. Um, there is an overture, because the way that this conversation was shaped and put together that's really exciting is that so many of you were asked what you wanted to uh, talk about with, uh, with Michelle Obama. And so those questions, those hundreds and hundreds of very, very rich and wonderful questions were my basis for beginning to craft and shape some themes, some areas. So your voices are in all of the questions and areas that we will uh, be going over today. And so I wanted to start off by saying that in the arts, we often say the specific is universal. And the kind of the topic I thought that we were really um, in, the zone, is the self in the world. So in the arts, we say the specific is universal, and from the village, we can know the world. And so today, in shaping this conversation around the self in the world and how all of us go about our individual lives from our communities out into larger worlds, I was thinking about how thinking about place. You went from a girl of the south side of Chicago to the global stage, filling this room here as we have come together with people who want to understand what we're thinking about from here to there. How do our roots define us as we move outward from where we begin? And also, just to sort of mark the space of the conversation, over the course of our many years of friendship and your increasingly uh, public life, <laughs> oh, so public. Um, you've always been someone who is self-effacing about your own accomplishments, almost matter-of-fact about them, and very empowering about the collective, always turning that individual energy out to, out to the collective. So we'll be thinking about how we take our power as well and move it out um, for other people. We're going to talk about how we can demonstrate and teach and encourage young people to keep on keeping on and how taking care of ourselves is a very important part of that, and also talk about how art and culture have a very unique and particular role in making our civic space more livable, more beautiful, more true, more hopeful. Um, so 
That's what we're going to talk Sounds about. Sounds good. You guys like that? Uh, uh, uh. All right. <laughs> okay. One snaps. Thing. That's what you all do, right? Mm. Yes. I know. Yes. Yeah, please. I love the yes, snap thing, I so let's make snap. sure that we do that. <laughs> 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 okay. So let's start off with the power of words and inspiration, um, because we know that words not only matter, but also words are how we, they carry meaning and they carry who we are. Our words and our language are the main way that human beings give themselves to each other and say who it is that they are. And you have put some words uh, out into the public that have been very, very useful to people. And I'm, I could list many, but of course, when they go, no, we go, hi. As much um, as we can. As much as we can, that's right. Yes, we always can. We, we always, always have yes, that high place. Yes, we, we carry can. that place. Yes, we can. Um, so I wonder, because that's been such a useful thing to so many people, what are, what are some words, songs, poems, prayers that have been and are meaningful guides for you? Uh, it, you know, I've, I've been thinking about this, whether they're, you know, words, music, all of that, there are many points of inspiration um, for me when you think about those. But when I think about the words that stay in my head, that guide me, what I wake up to, Every day, it's the voice of Marion and Frazier Robinson. Marion Robinson, who's sitting over there right now. Um, because it shows that, you know, words don't have to be poetic. They don't have to be set to music. Most of the words that guide us are those words that we've heard growing up, mm -hmm. those messages. And for me, I had some pretty powerful parents who were very understated and humble in their own rights. But I live each day trying to make them proud. And, and I think a, a lot of that you know, comes from my father. Many of you know my father's story, but my, my parents didn't go to college. Um, they were not of wealth. They were not of means. Uh, my father had MS, um, and he was a uh, an athlete until he was stricken with MS in the prime of his life. He used to box and swim. So you imagine someone with that much life all of a sudden for no apparent reason not being able to walk without the assistance of Cain. Uh, and that's how I always knew my father as someone with a disability. But the other thing I knew about my father was that even in his disability, he commanded a level of respect. Mm -hmm. um, he was the center of not just our nuclear family, but our, our family. You know, my father used to sit in his chair and people would come for advice. They would come for money. They would come, mm -hmm. come for love, for affirmation. He, and he would give that of affirmation so willingly. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing that I remember about my father is that he never complained. He got up, he went to work, not a, a, a work that filled him with passion. That was something that my parents didn't even understand, working for passion. You work to make a living. He worked at the water filtration plant right here in Chicago his entire life. He got up, he put on that blue uniform, he got in his car, and whatever pain he must have been experiencing throughout his life, the fatigue that comes from MS, the inability to lift your own leg without help and assistance, mm -hmm. um, he never complained. And I think for me and my brother to grow up watching somebody sacrifice that much, someone with that much power mm -hmm. and influence and love, uh, never complain once. You know, those are the things that I, that I, the, the, the stories, the messages, the images that roll around in my head that tell me I have no reason to complain mm -hmm. and that I am a blessed child. Maybe I didn't have much money, but I was blessed with the love of a father and a mother who uh, gave me gifts that were priceless. Mm -hmm. um, and for that, I owe so much. So I think about that. I think about making them proud. I think about with every word I, I utter, what does that mean for them? How do I speak to their legacy? Mm -hmm. So I don't know that it's a song. If I were to pick a song, it would be a Stevie Wonder song mm -hmm. of any kind. It, if, it, if there were poetic words, there'd be, they'd be the words of Amaya Angelou, powerful, you know, true. Um, but if they're everyday words, mm -hmm. they're the words of Marion and Fraser Robinson telling us to 
do what you say you're gonna do, mm -hmm. you know? To, to be honest and true, to treat people with dignity and respect. And it wasn't just their words, it was their actions. It was be open-hearted, to be empathetic, um, and to make your life useful. Mm -hmm. And to define that usefulness as broadly as you can. Those words guide me. Mm -hmm. And they led me to Barack Obama, who reminded me very much of my own father mm -hmm. in his decency and his honesty and his compassion. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that was my, um, that was my foundation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, what's so interesting is, is also about the words that weren't, weren't spoken, the words of complaint that weren't spoken and how much silences also teach us. Um, and I think also, you know, one of the amazing things about you is that you have such a healthy skepticism. Yeah. And I, <laughs> I say that, I'm not, like, true skepticism, which is to say, I wonder if your parents ever said anything to you along the line of, you know, and don't believe the hype. Mm, oh, gosh. You know, having Marion Robinson in the White House with you for eight years <laughs> is, a, is a grounding experience <laughs> for all of us, for every Obama. Marion Robinson was just not pressed ever. Um, yeah, she was like, you know, I can go home anytime. <laughs> it's like, yes, we know you can, Mom. <laughs> But, you know, yes, it's that sort of matter of fact, it's, you know, um, it's not where you live, it's not what you have, it's who you are. Yes. Um, and that was sort of the ethos of my entire family. I mean, we were working class folks from, you know, from my, in, uh, my immediate family to my extended family. We were a family of carpenters and, and teachers and police officers and, uh, you know, seamstress. Um, we weren't lawyers and doctors, you know, and there was a skepticism of those folks who tried to be uppity, mm. you know. There was a skepticism of, 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 of unabashed wealth um, or uh, privilege. There was a skepticism. My father was somebody who never believed in joining, that you were independent mm. throughout your life. So that those were kind of messages that we got, not just from my father, but from my grandparents, my grandfather. We were privileged to have been raised with all of my grandparents, maternal, paternal. So in Chicago, we talked about this at dinner, but in Chicago, you were very much a part of your neighborhood. And in, in, in our neighborhood, our neighborhood was comprised mostly of my extended family. <laughs> you know, so we lived in a, in a house above my maternal uh, aunt. Um, we lived around a corner from my grandmother and another aunt. My grandfather, my mother's father, they were separated, never divorced, but lived around a corner from each other. That's black Chicago right there. <laughs> they lived right around the other corner. My, functional. It's, it's functional dysfunction. Um, and they didn't speak to each other either. <laughs> it's like they lived around the corner, but you didn't talk to them. You didn't talk about the other one with the other one. And then my paternal grandparents lived in Parkway Gardens, which is really just a five minute drive from our house. Mm -hmm. um, so we grew up with a lot of these messages and, you know, my, my maternal grandfather Southside, we called him. He loved jazz and mm. uh, filled the house with music. He put speakers in every room of the house, even when my mother was young. Um, and because he didn't have a lot of money, all of his music collection came, they were sort of hodgepodge together, mm -hmm. turntables that didn't match, a reel to reel <laughs> that he found in the alley, you know, <laughs> cabinets that he made, speakers that he borrowed. But the, the, the house was filled with Miles Davis and Coltrane. We blew out candles to Ella Fitzgerald at birthdays, and mm. he fried chicken and made milkshakes at midnight, and they played mm. bid whist until all hours of the night. And in that household, there was healthy skepticism yes. and fear. There was fear of other people, fear of leaving that unit. There was fear of what could happen to you um, out there in the the big bad world. So we came from a place of skepticism. Mm -hmm. But it was interesting that my parents, out of all of that, they always pushed us beyond that initial fear. Mm -hmm. You know, I always talk about one of my favorite comedians, Chris Rock, tells this joke about what it's like living in a dangerous neighborhood. Mm -hmm. 
you know, that yes. your world just gets yes. more narrow. At first, they tell you, don't just stay on the block, don't uh -huh. leave, and then uh -huh. stay in the front yard, and then stay on the porch, and then stay in your room because it's dangerous, and before you know it, you're just hopping around on one foot in your living room. <laughs> A lot of black people live like that <laughs> because fear is real. But I had parents who pushed us beyond that fear. They encouraged us to not be so skeptical mm -hmm. that we couldn't explore and experience and take risks. Mm -hmm. And I don't know where they got that from because that's not how they were raised. They were very much raised to be within the limits that were set by segregation and Jim Crow and lynchings and uh, you know inequality. Mm -hmm. Uh, but my parents pushed us beyond that. Mm -hmm. But skepticism still was the foundation that yes. would protect you. So I think in many ways, it's that skepticism that I carry with me that, you know, you can, don't be too high. Don't, be, don't, don't, don't enjoy the highs too much. Don't w wallow in the lows too much. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a balance that you have to have in life to succeed. And mm -hmm. it takes a little skepticism to sort of uh, hold on to that. Yes. I got some That's snaps. Yeah. Mm. Um, and I think also <laughs> in that skepticism are, are, are real critical thinking tools mm -hmm. um, in order to, I, I remember there was a magazine profile, a New Yorker early profile of you where you talked about some of your uncles and said in another social order they would have been bank presidents. Absolutely. You know, with the way that yes. They, yes. they, their quality of mind, what mm -hmm. they were good at in particular, mm -hmm. but you were in a particular social order. Mm -hmm. And I think that being able to really have a critical understanding mm -hmm. of the lay of the land is also something that, that you've brought forward with you. You know, absolutely. And that's, you know, some of it is life context. Mm -hmm. Some of it is study. Some of it is statistics and understanding charts and graphs and how they, things work. That, you know, that's also what makes, I think, Barack and I such a good team. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he is a lot of the head and I operate a lot from the gut. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the sort of stuff that you learn about how the world works and that has informed me. And maybe it's growing up in the inner city, mm -hmm. you know, just we're walking around the block to school, you could get your butt kicked if you talk like a white girl. You had to figure out how to exist in a world where you were intelligent but still had to survive. Yes. Um, so there's a, there, there's a lot of that that comes, to, that, that comes into play as I understand how the broad world works mm -hmm. and how a, a, oppression and segregation and all of that, you know, gritty stuff works. Yes. Yes, yes. And you also just, in that beautiful portrait of your growing up, we're talking about living with art in the music that was playing with all yeah. of those rigged up uh, music, uh, rigged up uh, record players. Mm -hmm. And what it is to have art at the ready all the time to help you feel and live life. Could you talk more about, about living life with art in all kinds of ways? You know, I, I don't think I appreciated how much art was a part of our little modest working class life. Mm -hmm. And it was essential. My father was an artist, um, a beautiful artist. Um, he was a painter and a sculptor. Mm -hmm. Again, had he been from a different family of a different area, era of a different race, he might have known that art could have been a way of life. But that was, mm -hmm. to, to go back to the skepticism, yes. that, was, that was a luxury, you know? Mm -hmm. um, uh, but to watch him paint and sculpt, you know, he loved to do nudes and take a plain, mold of clay and turn it into, from the bottom up, something beautiful. Mm. Um, and uh, he worked with charcoals and uh, oils and water paints. It was a gift of, mm -hmm. of his. Um, so there was that part of it. Mm -hmm. you know, I used to paint all of the backgrounds in our little operetta workshop foundation. We used to sing and dance. I had uh, most of my family, they were musicians. My great aunt, she was a choir director at the church. And they taught us to sing and to be in plays and performing was a big part of uh, growing up, not to mention the music. Uh, you know, I did I have not a, know that. I, we, we did. Operetta? Uh, uh, the operetta, we didn't sing operatically, but uh -huh. you know, I, one, one year my brother was Hansel in the Hansel and Gretel production <laughs> and I was a fairy princess. <laughs> Oh, mommy's laughing, <laughs> remembering. <laughs> it was a good one. But every year there was some big performance at a church basement or in a school, you know, uh, 
theater that was borrowed and it was sort of a ragtag little theater group that my mm -hmm. my aunt used to teach but I think that that was my first th those were the little things in my life that were that that brought art into my world mm -hmm. but then as I went to school I realized that there were kids who were only there because of art mm -hmm. you know that's the power of art that we all know I mean it, it's it's art is the first language we speak Truly, you know, every child before they can talk, they're given some a, a pencil, a paper, yes. some crayon, and they're drawing, and it's life that yanks that instinct from them. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. We're now living in public school systems where art and music and PE, the things that bring life and joy are the first things that are cut. Mm -hmm. um, but when I was growing up, those are the things that would hook some of those kids that weren't good at math or reading yes. because their brains work differently. They were motivated by something different. For them, you would see those kids light up and it was time to draw or to speak or to sing. Um, that's the power of the arts because mm -hmm. as we know, it's often the hook that gets kids to then understand why math is important. It's the thing that gets them the school to do reading, mm -hmm. um, which is why we made art and music and culture such a centerpiece of our White House, yes. uh, because we are trying to remind this country, this world, that arts are not a luxury. You know, it's not something to be given to those who can afford it. That we have so many talented young people who are shaping this world and can shape a vision. It's the thing that unites us. I mean, we see that with, you know, my favorite piece of art to date right now is Hamilton, right? I mean, you, we see the power of arts, music, dance, rap, poetry, spoken word, you name it, to teach history in a yes. way that that history teacher just can't reach people. Yes. And so how, also, how we deny that is, you know, how we don't support that is amazing to me. And makes no sense. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that also, you know, you brought up those, all of the culture in your time in the White House. And I think that Earth, Wind & Fire was the first concert that you had. Yes. And so what I thought was amazing the governor's about ball. that, the Imagine governor's ball. Imagine you see ball. these governors jamming the Earth, I know Earth, they did though, fire. right? I mean, like, you know, it called them <laughs> into that space. But I think that what was so important about that was it was saying that just because you groove to it doesn't mean that it is not high art. What, what it would take for any musician to have the precision and mm -hmm. bright light of Earth, Wind & Fire's music, mm -hmm. it is virtuosity. It is an intellect. It is a skill. It is a talent. It's a gift. Yes. And we take it for granted because we enjoy it, which yes. is a sad kind of thing. Yes, um, yes. And I think also moving out, you know, to me what I see in that is Earth, Wind & Fire is of the basement, you know, Earth, Wind and Fire is of- The red uh, light. Of, of, of yes, yeah. of, of intimate spaces. Mm -hmm. But then it was on the, you know, on the world stage. I'm just carrying on as though mm -hmm. you didn't, didn't just do that. Right. Um, and so I think that, um, <laughs> That what is so, I think about, you know, the bard of Chicago, Gwendolyn Brooks, whose mm -hmm. name I always must call when we're in her space. Mm -hmm. you, she had a wonderful poem where she contrasted the Chicago Picasso, mm -hmm. which is a wonderful thing that it's in downtown space, with the wall of respect. Mm -hmm. To talk about what it meant in community for people to experience art and beauty and great, mm -hmm. greatness as a way of saying, this is who we are, mm -hmm. and this has brought us together. Mm -hmm. um, well, and you think about how little art there is, public art there is, in communities yeah. on the South Side, which is you know, one of the things we hope to do with the Obama Presidential Center. You know, and it, there's, it, it, there need to be places for public art outside, just like downtown, just like yep. the Picasso, just like yep. the Bean. Yes. You know, there's nothing, that th those pieces in communities are few and far between. That's right. That's right. And they become the gathering places for community, not just a place to see beauty and possibility, but you know, it's a place for people to come together. And we deserve those things in our communities just as That's much right. as the rest That's of the right. city. That's right. I haven't even turned a card. Oh, we got to okay. turn a card. Well, let's, let's turn a card. Turn card. Well, we've covered all of it. So words and inspiration. <laughs> so now um, uh, this is an interesting um, zone. And there were some wonderful questions from one from Sri Lanka and some others about using your voice. Ooh. Um, and about so moving out of the zone of, of the voice in an artistic sense, how do you use your voice mm. to express disagreement? Hmm. 
How can you be productive in disagreement? Mm -hmm. What do you know about that? Where did you see that modeled? And how do you take that forward? Well, well in thinking about this question, I started a little bit, I pulled back a bit, mm -hmm. because I think the question of how you use your voice comes after you find your voice. Yes. And I think that that's something that a lot of people take for granted, that having a voice just happens, mm -hmm. you know? So in order to know how to use it and how to use it carefully and how to debate, you have to find it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in particular for women, as we're seeing now, finding that voice, yes. you know, do, it, it doesn't just happen overnight. And I think about me and sort of where did my voice come from? Again, we talked about this at our table, our dinner. Mm -hmm. But again, going back to Marion and Frazier, um, I realize now in hindsight that I had some special parents who, from a very, very young age, again, not people who read parenting books, they probably didn't think that their role models of parents were as perfect for them. I, my, my grandparents were better grandparents than they were parents. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but for some reason, my parents understood that teaching children at a young age that their voice was valuable was important. Mm -hmm. So I didn't live in a household where kids were taught to be seen and not heard. Um, I was allowed to speak my mind at three and four. They asked my opinion. They wanted mm -hmm. input from me and my brother about things that involved the family and life. We knew about money and paying bills mm -hmm. and we knew about issues in the family. It you know, had to be respectful, but the notion that a five-year-old wouldn't have feelings about how their life went mm -hmm. was not something that my parents believed in. You know, my mother always said she was raising adults, she wasn't raising children, so she mm -hmm. spoke to us mm -hmm. as people mm -hmm. because that's what you needed to practice. And I think that all of that early stuff, for those of us who were parents out there who were thinking mm -hmm. about how to empower our children, mm -hmm. it starts very early. Mm -hmm. So you can't shush them because you don't agree with them. Mm -hmm. Because every time you shush them, you're telling them, or you're telling them to respect your elders even when they're wrong. There's a, there's a difference between just respecting something that you see is wrong and, mm -hmm. and, and not feeling it and speaking out about it. You yes. do it in a respectful way, but you're never, I, we were never taught that our, what we saw and what we felt wasn't real. Mm -hmm. you know, so if a teacher treated me unfairly in class, I couldn't just immediately go off on them. I could come home and go off about it in the kitchen, and then we'd talk about it, and then Marion would hustle on up to school and quietly uh -huh. go off on them. Uh -huh. Unbeknownst to me, I've yes. heard of many teachers that got shut down, you know, and just like, well, you going back to school and you do what you're supposed to do. But I always knew I had a defender, I had an advocate, yes. which made me ready to use my voice. Yes. You know, so when we think about women in particular, you know, we ask them to speak up, we ask them to speak their mind, we ask them to just say no, to speak out against sexual harassment, to speak out against inequality, but if we don't teach our young girls to speak at an early age, that doesn't just happen, mm -hmm. you know? That's not, it takes practice to have a voice. You have to use it again and again and again before you can say no or stop, don't touch me, mm -hmm. you know? If you're taught that adults are right all the time, it's hard to go That's against right. the power that is around you. And I, I, I don't think that I had those roadblocks when I was young. Mm -hmm. So I thought I was funny. I thought I was smart when I was uh, little. I thought that uh, I made sense. Yes. You know, so from moving from that place of understanding the power and the rightness and the truth of my voice, mm -hmm. then how you use it is more linked to your values than anything yes. else, right? That's right. And then it goes back to how you were raised. Mm -hmm. Because when you have a voice, you know, you just can't use it any kind of way, you know? Mm -hmm. You can't just say what's that. This whole tell it like it is business, that's nonsense. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't just say what's on your mind. You don't tweet every thought. Most of your first initial thoughts are not, yes worthy of the light of day. Yes. <laughs> and I, I'm not talking about anybody in particular. I'm talking about us all. <laughs> we are because, so not because, talking about anybody in particular. Because everybody no. does that. I mean, that's yeah. the thing about young people. Yeah. It's like tw tw tweeting and social media. 
That is a powerful weapon it is. that we just hand over to little kids. You know, a 10 year old, here you go. Mm. Tell it like it is. And it's like, no, you don't. Yep. You need to think and spell it right and have good grammar, <laughs> too. <laughs> yes. And I think also that understanding of not only of having a voice, but also understanding that you have advocates mm -hmm. in your parents. Oh, and, God, and, and yeah. that is part of that. I mean, I think about that was definitely, I'm, I'm thinking, was I taught that way explicitly? Mm -hmm. And I think I was actually. Yeah, yeah. And was also taught, my dad always, I had a crisp bill on me at all times mm -hmm. because he said, if you have to leave the job, the man, the situation, danger. You got just, your 20. You got your 20. It was a 20 and it was You're crisp. Out of there. <laughs> but you get out <laughs> and right. then you, people will help you that's sort right. the other things That's out right. later. That's and that right. that is a profound uh, yeah. thing to carry in yeah. this life with all of its yeah. unexpected things. But when you have the power of support, yes, then I think how you debate, and you, you're a lot more respectful. Yes. You're a lot more cautious. You know, you're not so ready, you're, a little, you're humble, you're yes. a little skeptical, and that skepticism is not just about the other person, but you have to have a healthy skepticism in your own view, yes. that you are not always right. You know, that you have to, as Barack had said, we all have to be open to the differences and the possibilities of other people's truths. Mm -hmm. So you're careful with your words. You're careful mm -hmm. with how you debate. And I think, you know, when you're the, the first lady or the president, the commander in chief, and you have that voice and that power and that platform, I think mm -hmm. the response, what comes with that is the responsibility to know that every word you utter has consequences. Yes. You know, it, it can, and I said this in the course of many of my speeches, that words matter at this level. Um, they, and you learn how much they matter at this level, but it's, it, that doesn't mean that anybody in this room is free to be careless with words and how they debate, because it, 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 at this level, you see how much they, it, the words mm -hmm. matter. But the truth of how much words matter is true for every, each true. and every one of us. Mm -hmm. So you can't just slash and burn up folks just because you think you're right. You know, you have to treat people as if they are precious, all of them, even the people you don't agree with. Mm -hmm. If we thought that way, you know, if, if, if we lived life that way, we wouldn't have to be taught how to debate. We would just be treating each other as decent human beings mm -hmm. um, and we would treat one another with respect. Mm -hmm. But again, I think that starts with the values that you learn growing up. Mm -hmm. Because if nobody has valued your voice, it's hard for you to know control and compromise. And it starts very young, I think. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the consistency of seeing those values throughout your life affects how you debate, how you dis disagree, how you talk, how you advocate, mm -hmm. how you speak up for yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's all practice. And when that, when that leads us into civic work, community work, um, and this is a, you know, sort of a, a little bit of a move into thinking about how you take care of yourself so that you can be a helpful person in your community, so that all of this wisdom can be shared. I wanted to um, just read a few lines from a poem that I really love that feels like it's speaking to, um, to what you were describing earlier with your parents, and maybe it's not here, but it's by Marge Piercy, a great Detroit poet, just a few lines. Um, and this is her poem, many of you probably know this, it's called To Be of Use. And uh, it, the excerpt goes, the people I love the best jump into work head first without dallying in the shadows. I love people who strain in the muck and the mud to move things forward, who do what has to be done again and again. The pitcher cries out for water to carry and a person for work that is real. So that's from March Percy, uh, Piercy's Beautiful. To Be of Use. Mm -hmm. I, I, I love it. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think that that's all of you it's here. Everybody here. Um, uh, you are the people who just get up and do what mm -hmm. has to be done. That is you, that is the president. Um, but you know, you can give and give and give to be yeah. helpful, but how do you think about staying strong and the role of self-care, not as a luxury, but as a part of being mm. a helpful person in community? 
Oh yeah, it's stuff we talk. My girlfriend's circle. We talk about that all the time. Self care, and I think self care is something that you have to practice as well. Um, but you have to value yourself to want to care about yourself, um, and it starts there. You have to think that you're worthy. You know, because sometimes a lot of, of of us do gooders, a lot of us doers. We're doing for others because somehow we can't also, we can't do it for ourselves. So the work that we do sometimes is a distraction from focusing on what we as the individual needs. It's easy to mm -hmm. focus on fixing somebody else, you know, because it allows you to ignore the stuff that you need to work on yep. internally. So it's a it's, sometimes it's a distraction. It's a good socially acceptable distraction, <laughs> but it's a distraction nonetheless. Um, but I think it starts with thinking about that, that point. It's like, what are we all doing for ourselves in the midst of this? How do, we, how do we expect to keep going and doing for others if we ourselves are not emotionally, physically healthy? You know, if we don't take that time in that moment, and for, for, for so many, it is really just a moment. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a moment to take some time out to exercise. It's, it, it, you know, nobody's telling anybody to run a marathon, you know, it's just a matter of like, figure out how to walk every day, how to stand up, how to move your body, you know, how to, uh, you know, get blood pump, pumping through you. It doesn't have to be miraculous, but we have to think about well, when it's time to do that, why, what stops us? And, and that, Everybody in this room has to answer that for themselves because those are the demons that haunt us, the things that keep us from taking care of ourselves. But you also learn when you're a mother, this is something that I learned, and I learned a lot of this when I became a mother because you, when you have children, you have to be fiercely organized to get anything done. Mm -hmm. um, and I learned that if I don't put myself up on the priority list, that somehow my kids will eventually get knocked down mm -hmm. on that list. If I'm not protecting my time, if I'm not learning how to say no, even to the best things, even to the most worthy things because I need to sleep or I need to eat or I need to take time out to exercise, that I am no good to my children. And once again, as one of those do-gooders, it's easier for me to make changes because of this baby mm -hmm. <laughs> than it is to do it for myself. Mm -hmm. um, but we need to be having that conversation uh, because our health is, it, it is the thing that will keep us going which is why I focus so much on health and nutrition mm -hmm. in the White House. Um, it's something that we cannot afford to ignore, that self-care, that meditation, that time out, that yoga, that whatever that is for you, it has to happen. So one of the tricks that I learned, um, and I learned this as a working mother, because I looked up and I realized a year can go by and I talked to my sister-in-law about this too, that you say yes to everybody else first. You say yes to the conference, yes to the rally, yes to the speech, yes to the, you know, to the political event. And before you know it, your calendar is booked, right? Yes. Your whole year, you have given it away. If you think about it, by so readily saying yes to everyone first, you look up and you don't have time. Because let me tell you, when people are trying to get stuff done, they're organized. They got people, they're calling you a year in advance. I started to get insulted when people would call me a year in advance. Mm. Because I'm sort of like, so you want me to give you in a year, you want me to tell you now in a year that you can have this whole day mm. before me and my kids have ever even thought about what that day means for us. Mm -hmm. Well, do we want that day? Do my kids need that day for a class or a potluck? Or, because what would happen is that you'd say yes, and then little Malia would come up, and it's like, we got a class play. Well, mommy gave that time away a year ago. <laughs> and little Malia's like, well, I wish I had a scheduler. I would have gotten on your calendar sooner, but I'm four. <laughs> and you start thinking to yourself, well, yeah, that's kind of crazy. Um, and it plays out in terms of whether you're gonna go to the gym or not. You know, I mean, as my mom says, we all get up and we go to work, sick, tired, you name it, but the minute you talk about, can I walk on the treadmill for 30 minutes? I don't have time. Mm -hmm. 
So I started working my schedule so that we'd start the year before I would do anything, I would put me and my kids on my calendar mm -hmm. first. So that t takes work and it would, you know, and I granted I had helps and assistants and people who could look at calendars. And when you're first lady, you got a lot of help. So the school will actually like change report card dates for you. It's like, we really want to come. Can you figure this out? Can you really tell us when the class play will be? Can you organize this in a mm -hmm. year? But we would force the school to answer some questions. <laughs> <laughs> and it would, it would take a couple of weeks to get them to like, make sure every parent-teacher conference was on there, every school game, every tournament. And we put, I put that on the, the calendar first. Mm -hmm. Then I would put me on there. <laughs> when do I want to hang out with my girlfriends? When am I going to exercise? You know, when am I going to take a vacation? When am I going to breathe? How, mm -hmm. how do I want my life to flow first? Mm -hmm. I put that on the calendar. Yep. And then what was left was left for everybody else. Work and, well, Barack was on there too. Let me not forget, because he might, <laughs> just in case he slips in. Honey, you were there too. <laughs> Put him on the, he, he, was, he was up there, he was up high. <laughs> but see, so what, I mean, what you're hearing is gospel here, because yeah. I think that it's actually very profound and you always had a great deal of clarity. Mm -hmm. We became mothers within two months of mm -hmm. each other with the children. They were on the floor playing with each on other. On the floor, oh, so And cute. we'd be talking and drinking wine. It's like, they're yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just a little wine. It was before they could walk and yeah, get into things. Yeah, just a little bit. Um, but, but, I mean, you, but you always had clarity also that you had to be systematic, that you had to, you know, put the oxygen mask on first. And also that this myth of the superwoman, you know, oh, this idea that, that, that's that you would lie. only be made crazy yeah. trying to do everything yeah. simultaneously. Yeah. And that very, you know, kind of almost methodical breakdown and ordering um, is a, a hugely important principle that just, I think, needs to be drilled into and us over and over. And that's, we are not ruthless about ourselves. Yeah. You know, we do, when, when you talk about all of that that we do, we're all, everybody in this room is used to doing that for their project, for their organization, for yeah. their kids, for yep. their, for their uh, program participants, for their community. We all operate like that. Everybody in this room operates like that. We just cut that off when it comes to our, our lives. Yeah. We don't apply those same principles. And that's what I said to myself. I'm going to apply that because, look, I can get a lot done. I'm very ruth ruthlessly efficient. Mm -hmm. But I have to be organized about me. I have to be as organized about my life as I am about my work. I have, yes. to, be, I have to plan my happiness. That's the thing we think happiness just happens. And it can, but you got to work at some happiness too. You yep. got to think yep. about in this year, when am I going to laugh? <laughs> when am I going to have fun? When am I going to stop and smell the roses? And then you got to plan it. Yeah. Because if you don't, the work, the need, the agenda will always overcome everything. And look, the thing is, the work, the need, the agenda will always be there. Because even in the process of me putting myself higher up on my list, the work was still there. Yes. You know, we got a lot done in the eight years that I was first lady. Quite I'll frankly, say. I'm pretty yes. proud of that. Yes. But I, I was able to do that and, and create sanity for my team, too, because a lot of us are working and leading teams of people, and they will take their sanity cues from us at the top. Mm -hmm. So if we're just crazy pushing all the time yeah. for every, what I would tell my team for every event I do, that means you're doing like three times the work just to get it done. So, and Tina's over there laughing, but <laughs> I would tell Tina, don't put it on the calendar because that means like three times the work for everybody else. So everybody's gotta be ready to understand that. Mm -hmm. So I always put work and time into context. Yes. And that's something that we, we don't do. We just let it happen. We let it take, take over us. Mm -hmm. And I think we can do good for others and take, and we can do a better job of doing good for others if we take care of ourselves. But we have to start having those conversations. And explicitly, I mean, to, to the question of women and women friends and sister friends, you know, and, and this business of scheduling your laughter, which um, I, I have observed that in the presidential years, 
it feels that your your friendships with women have deepened. Oh your my God, your yeah. you know circle of of us has has deepened. You fed that, mm -hmm. um, and we have been fed. We fed each other in that. But can you talk about your women friends and Ooh, laughing yeah. and and why that's necessary? Let me tell you, I love my husband, and he is my rock. But my girlfriends are my sanity. Um, and when you live eight years in the White House, where you can't even open a window, mm. um, you can't walk out on your balcony without notifying three people so that they can shut down security. Um, your walk outside is a walk around that same circle in the South Lawn over and over and over again, because the thought of you leaving those gates requires 50 people's attention and work and inconvenience. Um, when you live like that for eight years, you need your girlfriends, mm -hmm. you know, and in order to, you know, and, and nothing is spontaneous. And so I, I learned because all our spontaneity was basically taken away from us. Um, you know, it, so you have to plan when you yeah. can't be spontaneous. There was never any such thing as me. I even do this now. It's like, can I leave? I'm asking somebody, can I walk out the door yet? Uh -huh. I don't move until some 30-year-old tells me, <laughs> ma'am, you can, you can leave now. It's like, okay, all right, yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Um, so I had to plan my time with my girlfriends that kept me grounded, you know, and brought me laughter. I mean, I have a whole, and I have a crew of just wonderful, I am blessed to have a wonderful community of girlfriends and people I've raised my kids with. And you know, I have a whole set of mothers at our, our girls' school who keeps me out of the gossip, but in, notified by what's going on. It's like, ooh, girl, you don't want to go to that potluck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, OK, thank you. Um, so all of that has kept me whole in a way that, and, and you know, that's something for all folks. But I think women, we do it better than men, but you know, yeah, I know, sad for you guys. <laughs> Y'all should get you some friends. <laughs> <laughs> friends. <laughs> get you some friends and, t and talk to each other. <laughs> Because that's the other thing we do. We straighten each other out on yeah, some things. Our yeah, girlfriends, yeah, yeah. we just like, and I just wish like sometimes, Baraki, who are you talking to? <laughs> and it can't just be Marty. <laughs> this is a but home conversation. This is a home conversation, but every one of you, as I see a lot of men laughing, uh, y'all need to go talk to each other about your stuff because there's so much of it. <laughs> It's so, it's so messy. <laughs> Just talk about why y'all the way you are. <laughs> because you're running the world. And I know that's one of the questions is like raising our men. We got to rest talking to my you mother about that, that the other day. Yes. It's like the problem in the world today is we, we, we love our, our boys <laughs> and we raise our girls, you know? We raise them to be strong and sometimes we take care not to hurt men. And, mm -hmm. and I think we're, we pay for that a little bit. Mm. And that's a we thing, because we're raising them, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's powerful to have strong men, but what does that strength mean? Mm -hmm. You know, does it mean respect? Does it mean responsibility? Does it mean compassion? Or are we protecting our men too much so they feel a little entitled and a little, you know, uh, you know a little self-righteous sometimes? Mm -hmm. But that's kind of on us too, as, 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 as women and yeah. mothers, yeah. you know, as we nurture men and push girls to be perfect. Mm. I, yeah, mm. I wanted to get more deeply into that. <laughs> no, because, um, I, and I was thinking about the conversation that you had recently with Shonda Rhimes, and you were talking about um, child rearing, and you, you said, we have to cherish our girls. You put the word cherish. And I was like, yes, yes, yes. And I also, as a mother of boys and as a, you know, sort of auntie to many, thought, but what about our boys? Uh, so, can, you know, can you, can, you, can you say more? Because I also think, not just our black boys, but, you know, I, I think that cherishing black boys um, is necessary in a world where they are not always safe, loved, or valued. 
I mean, I know we, we see that the same way, but I'm really interested in, in thinking further about um, what we teach our girls and our boys, what cherishing and love means for boys who are also carrying sometimes a responsibility that is too much when it comes with all that, you know, be strong, lead the yeah, world stuff. Yeah, yeah, so, and look, and I, I don't have boys. I'm not raising boys, I'm raising girls, so a lot of my focus as a mother, you know, I'm thinking about how do I make sure these girls are sturdy and able mm -hmm. to, sort of exist in this world where, and it's a world that is dangerous yep. for women, you know? Um, but I think it goes back to Marian Robinson. It's like, we have to raise our children to be people. Whether they have had struggles or whatever the world has for them, it's, yep. we have to raise them to be ready to be independent, well-meaning, kind, compassionate people. And I don't know that that's different for boys or girls, regardless of what they've, they're, they're confronting in the world. Yep, Sometimes yep, yep. we treat our children too preciously because mm -hmm. of the issues they've dealt with. I mean, it's like Barack and I thought about with Malia and Sasha, okay, we could have spent eight years feeling sorry for them, mm -hmm. that they were living in a bubble that every misstep for them would be on YouTube or you know, that they had to drive around in their teenage years with men with guns, that, you know, their privacy, that they didn't have access to their father in a way. We could have felt bad for them, and that, there would have been a truth there. But our view was that this is where, this is life for them. This is their life. And we can't apologize for the life that they have because a whole lot of it is good. Mm -hmm. So it's like, get up. Get up, go to school, yep. don't feel sorry for yourself. Yep, yep, it's hard, but it's hard for everybody. Go yep. to school, get over yep. it. Yep. So yep. for our men, it's true. Life's hard. It ain't yep. fair, but you got to get up. You got still got to be a man. You got to yep. get out there. You gotta, I can't protect you from everything. I can't cherish you to death. Mm. So I have to ra we have to raise our children to be the adults that we want them to be. Yes. And that starts young. So you can't be so afraid that life will break them mm -hmm. that you don't prepare them for life. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that, it, that is as true for our boys as it is for our girls. But sometimes our fear mm -hmm. keeps us from pushing our kids out into the, yes. the cold, cruel world. Yes. And then they're not ready and we wonder why. Yep. Yep. We yep. wonder why they're broken, why they are, you know, why they're nervous, why they're fearful, why they, you know, but it starts young, yep, yep, those messages. Yep. yep. We have amazingly come to I time. Know, and we didn't even, I, my cards, I didn't we, even we didn't need get my through cards. The cards. We just talked around to all kinds of things, but I did want to end with a wonderful question. So two, one question from me, you know we're gonna end here, and another wonderful, wonderful question from the audience. Okay. Um, from a listener in Detroit. Um, Detroit. Uh, actually, I, don't, I just wanted to say a listener in Detroit like I was a DJ, but okay, it might good. not have been a listener in right. Detroit. Um, <laughs> but so my, my question <laughs> is, um, is an example of something that has given you hope in the last week. Oh, and the yeah. audience question, which is a beautiful one, is what has recently brought you to tears? Oh. And you could answer that in a couple of different ways, however you wish. Mm. Hope is right in this room. This, these, this summit, all of you here, the conversations, the, you know, your voices, your missions, your goals, the possibilities, that you all have to be leaders in the world, that, that gives me hope. You know, I can sleep better after this because this isn't just happening here, it's happening around the world. So thank you for giving me personally a little hope. It's been fun to watch and it will be fun to watch what you continue to do. Um, what has brought me to tears um, uh, in, Fun ways, in all ways, the, probably the answer is children. Mm -hmm. Children, you know? I mean, my children have brought me, my two girls have brought me so much happiness and pride that uh, how they have carried themselves and responded to pressures that they didn't ask for, living a life that they didn't want, um, and t coming out on the other end as good, solid people. Yes. That happiness and pride can bring me to tears just yes. talking about them. Yes. Um, 
you know, tears of, of sadness, children. You know, when I see any child mistreated or unloved uh, or uneducated or unwanted, when we don't value our children, the, the, the most precious people on this planet, and we do it so often when we don't want our taxes raised or we don't want kids to be educated equally or we don't really focus on health care and we're not thinking about our environment. I've worked at ch in hospitals. I have seen children dying of cancer at very young ages, little babies in the NICU. And anytime I think about the brokenness that is in us mm. that doesn't force us to get our acts together for our children, you know, when we talk about immigration and our DACA kids, and we talk about, you know, what we want for this world, when I think about what we are not willing to do for our kids, that brings me to tears. Yes. Um, but then I can, you know, have tears of just so much complete joy when I think of all of the interactions that I've had with children in, over the course of my life and in the last eight years. Uh, you know, little Girl Scouts uh, sleeping, having a sleepover on the White House lawn, mm. you know, uh, little trick-or-treaters, um, little kids that, you know, are just so full of wonder and, and joy, the little ones who don't know to be hateful yet, who are still, you know, they still rely on us. Um, they still look to us to protect them and to love them. And they are so open, mm. you know, so... That brings me to tears, the, just yeah. the, that sheer happiness and the innocence of children. Yes. And I always think that if we are guided by that very raw instinct in us as the producers of human life, that if we, you know, just act every day, not for ourselves, not for some greater good, but just for the little kids in our lives, you know? And we, we treat those kids and we think that the kids that we know, the ones that we've born life to, that we auntie and uncle and we mentor, if we value them and we value all kids as much as we value them, we will be fine. Yep. If we operate with that level of goodness in our hearts. Yes. But that requires us as the grown-ups to sacrifice a lot more than we're willing to do. It requires us to be put on the back burner in the way that my mother and father put themselves on the back burner to make us the most special people in the world. Mm -hmm. So we have to get out of the way. Our egos, our, you know, our, our hatred, our jealousy, we have to push that all down as the adults in the room because we are now all adults and we have to get out of the way for the possibility of children. And I hope that everyone of you in this room leads with that sentiment, with that compassion, with that vision, that this isn't about us. Yeah. It's about our kids. And if we can do that, we'll get this right. Yes. You know, but that puts us way far down on the totem pole. <laughs> you know? yeah. Our egos have to be checked in a very powerful way. Yes. And uh, we have work to do uh, on that front. Well... Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Elizabeth, Thank you. And I have my one girlfriend. More thing to say. Oh, wait, wait. She, and one more thing. One more today. thing. I'm concluding this, which is to say um, just that, uh, I didn't mean for you to go down. Um, but the, what I just wanted to say in saying thank you to you is that the, the, your intimate self, the self you are up close, the self that I feel so lucky to know and love, is the same self that you share. That self is consistent, and I think that in that is a powerful, powerful, powerful lesson and example of knowing yourself and sharing that love in a consistent way. And um, for that, we all thank you. So thank you. Thanks, babe. You guys, thanks so much.